<clears throat> First of all, Fred, where were you actually born? In in, <laughs> in Townley's Hospital, up <laughs> Crescent Road, which is now Bolton Royal Hospital. Yeah, yeah. Where did you go to school? Ten Mitles on Manchester Road, which is now long gone. You know, it's a great shame, really, because it were a beautiful old building, and it um, it, uh, it it was situated right in what is now the middle of St Peter's Way. Uh, and they, you know, they just flattened it for the sake of, uh, you know, what can you put it, advance in a way. That <laughs> motorway, a, that a new, motorway's got a lot to answer for. Yeah, they for built a way, new horrible flat roof one across the road, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Can you tell our listeners about, uh, oh, something about your home and family? Yeah, well, I, I, at Burnham Park, you know, I lived in 8 Alfred Street, which, of course, is still standing. Uh, and my brother, uh, my younger brother, he's, he, we were never very close. He, he were a, a football fan, you see, and I had no great interest in football. Uh, my father were, worked in a bleach works, you know, which in Bolton at that time there were quite a lot of bleach works, uh, which of course have all gone. There's one left up in uh, <coughs> My mother. Uh, double in between being an housewife and a child lady at the gasworks, <laughs> uh, and I, of course, became a joiner uh, when I was 15 years old, and I served my time till I was 22 years old uh, doing joinery, and of course, my life of a steeplejack didn't really start properly till I'd done my national service, you know, come out in the army. Were there any other members of the family interested in steeplejacking? No, 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 none at all, you know, my Mom, mother thought I was crazy, you know. Uh, how, how did you, you come into the profession? Well, well... Some from, unusual thing, yeah, yeah, well, you know, from for a being, local lad to do, yeah, to but, be a steeplejack. Yeah, but from being a kid, if you think, when I, when I used to go on top of the Earl of Bramford Slaggy, which here again, St Peter's Way, has cut right through the middle of it, it was quite a good vantage point, you got... You got a fairly good view of the wall of Bolton Town Centre, and and of, as far as Salford and Manchester and Bury, it, it was quite an high up place, and you could see they've actually bulldozed it quite flat now, and it's the Rakes Lane Industrial Estate now. But you were a few yards above, you know, everybody else, and with a with a cheap pair of binoculars, I used to count the chimney stacks, and there were always somebody mending one, you know, like there'd be a black line across the top which designated a platform, mm -hmm. and of course when I discovered one of these, even if it'd be as far away as Pendlebury or somewhere like that, I'd get on my bicycle and ride out to see what they were doing, you know, so to see what the quality of the scaffolding that always intrigued me, like. Some of it were terrible, it looked like a biplane had crashed into its top and sort of come to our planks going yeah. all over the place. But others were really well done, you know. You could you could even stand below and look up and, and the sun would be shining through the gaps in between the planks, you know. Uh, all dead in line, perfect, you yeah. know. Mm. And I strove later on in my life to be a steeplejack like them men were, you know. Uh, but then, Unfortunately, as you know, as we both know, it's... Um, a profession which is rapidly dying out because there's not many young people who are prepared to go into it and have all the problems <laughs> and the the wet <laughs> and windy job that it yeah. is. Oh, ah, yeah, terrible. Yeah. How well, did you come into the profession? Well, well, I used to go actually talking to steeplejacks when them them who could sort of tell you a bit about the job. A lot of them couldn't, you know. They didn't know really why they were there, you know. They were there for the money uh, and. Uh, one day, under stroke of luck, I met one who, who were a cut above the others. He'd been a draftsman, and he'd only come to help his father-in-law who to own the steeplejack company, and he decided he liked it, so he stopped. And of course, the I learned more off him really. I how to put ladders up a chimney by easy stages drawing on the flagstones with a piece of broken slate, you know, because nobody had any pens. <laughs> uh, and and I learned really the basics of steeplejacking. You know, by talking to him on numerous occasions we met when they would mend in a chimney here and a chimney there, you know. And, mm. and then I, I, I had, I begged, borrowed and stole a few bits of ladders and, and like to mimic being a steeplejack, I used to put the ladders up gable ends on houses and point the gable end, you see, which I soon had enough money to buy ten ladders. And of course, I bought ten ladders, and I hadn't, I hadn't got a motor van, you know, or anything like that. I only had my bicycle, uh, ten ladders, 
Um, kids used to steal rope from the goods yard behind Trinity Street Station and make swings on the great iron bridge behind Burning Park. Yeah. And when it was dark, I used to go up and pinch it off there. So <laughs> it was really second hand thieving. Yeah. It weren't really, a, a, you know, going into the marshalling yard and pinching a hundred foot length of rope, you know. Kid, I let the kids do that for me, you know, like Fagan, yeah. you know. <laughs> and the, the thing is that then... Even while I was still joinering, I, I managed to get a job knocking a chimney down on a, on a foundry at Nelson Street, and whistling gases. And I got the princely sum of 90 odd quid for this job, uh, yeah. which were a lot of money then, you know. And uh, So I bought some more ladders, you know. I didn't, I didn't squander any of it, I just kept buying more ladders. And then so you finally, had the equipment then? Yeah, then the. the me and a friend of mine did this chimney at weekends, you see, and, and from the back window of my Uncle Fred's temperance bar, you could see the thing going less in height, you see, every weekend. And one weekend we were in my Uncle Fred's temperance bar, and uh, this guy who I didn't really know, you know, but he looked a bit posh, and we had a trilby and a tie on. And he, uh, he said, hey, you're not working today, lads, to me and my sidekick, you know. And I said, well, no, we've done that job, you know. I said, there's another job a bit further up, if you look, there's another chimney. And lightning conductor like a blade of grass bending over in wind down. light. And he said, oh, I know Mr. Farmworth, who owns Robert Farmworth and Company, fine spinners and doublers or whatever. And he said, I'll have a word with him. Anyway, I hadn't even got a telephone. But I got a letter in due course off Mr. Farmworth. And we went and we got another job, which was a repairing job, which were really lucrative, 120 quid or something like that. More money, you know. <laughs> anyway, then I got that. And, and then, what I didn't know, he had another mill up, walked in. And some other steeplejack company had got the ladders up. And they told him, like, oh, we're in a terrible state and top 20 feet wanted off it. Uh, you know, would... Would, would I go and have a look, you see, and I went and looked at it, and it didn't want some off top, but it didn't want 20 foot off, you know, like, we, we took five foot off it, put some iron bands around it, pointed top 10 foot for about 500 quid, which were incredible, I mean, I, I was like a millionaire, and of course, then I, I'd, I'd actually passed my medical for going into the army, the army and yeah. so I went to, did my two years in Germany, come back, and now they go up being a steeplejack. And I realise now what we're wrong. I was too young, you know. It, like, when you're too young, it can often go against you, you know. If, if a man owns a 200-foot chimney, you don't want some young chap who not had a lot of experience mending it, you know. And I didn't realise that. And I, and I was beginning to despair, because everywhere I went trying to secure a contract for mending a chimney, <laughs> they more or less buggered me off, you know. Yeah. And uh, anyway... I, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but I remember you mentioned to me about doing the gilding oh, on Bolton yeah, Church yeah, in yeah, the centre yeah. of town. How did yeah. that come about? Well, it, it all stemmed from the first job I ever got. Like the, the I was passing a brewery, Oakcroft's Brewery, long gone, demolished, and uh, they have the teeniest little chimney, a bit like mine I've got here in Garden. And the owner's son were leaning on gate post, and I, and I said to him, Hey, Tom, I knew him from school days, you see. I said, Hey, Ask your dad if I can mend your chimney. I want to mend a chimney, and I haven't mended one, and I've been, you know, I'm self-employed for six months just doing a slate here and a chimney pot there and a back gate and a bit of guttering, just like I did before when I were a joiner. Sort of job in joining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, yeah. Anyway, out come his father, and I got the job. I'll never forget the price as long as I live. 45 quid. Doing it for now, you know. But I needed an iron band for round top, and my father had introduced me to this back street mechanic, I call him, you know, he, he, like, like, you know, around every corner there's a man who mends cars. Yeah. Well, like one of them, but he, made, he did work for spinning mills, you see, and he had all welding gear and all that, like, and uh, anyway, I went seeing him about making me this iron band. I mean, I could make the thing here now in my own workshop in an hour, but then I hadn't got all these facilities, you see. Yeah. Anyway, uh... He said, oh, I'll make it six quid, you know, with this iron band. I said, well, I can't pay you till I've, till I've <laughs> got me pay. 45 quid. And, oh, don't worry about that, like, you know, and all. Anyway, he made me the iron band. I stuck it up on the chimney, finished the job off, got the money, went to pay him. By this time, I'd graduated to a 1927 
AJS, AJS motorbike. I remember yeah. reading about Yeah, that. right. Well, I've got my motorbike and uh, I chuff into his little yard up Jolly Old Road, it were. And he says, uh, I've been talking to Canon Norburn, the vicar of Bolton, you know, he says, he wants to see you about the weather vanes on the parish church. Good God, you know, 188 feet high, like, you know, and if I'm not got enough ladders to get up there, then I thought, well, there's a spiral staircase in there up the inside, you see. Anyway, I've got to go and meet the vicar. Well, it was a very frightening experience, you know. He weren't just an ordinary vicar, he were a canon and vicar of Bolton. <laughs> anyway, I, I chuffed into the, uh, the cemetery on my 1927 motorbike, and he sat there on a farm in sun, the lovely morning, and and at side of him's parked a 1929 Umber car oh, wow. with a with a fabric body, you know, vintage yeah. car. So we were like, love at first sight. For an hour, we talked about vintage vehicles, <laughs> and then, uh, it, needless to say, I got the job, and and I got half a page in in Bolton Evening News of pictures from up at top of tower and up Church Gate, looking at the tower and all that. Now, the, it was the time they were knocking Grand Theatre down on Church Gate when I were doing that job. It's it's 40 years ago, and uh, it gave me an unbelievable amount of confidence. You know, you only need one good, but you know, good start, like yeah, sort kick, of thing. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I, I mean, I've been to the end of many a vicarage drive, dithering in my boots, scared of it, having been rejected, and say, "Oh no, no, go away." We have Faulkner's from Manchester. I had that once. Uh, St Paul's on. Uh, on uh, Dean's Gate, uh, ball had fell off top, and he, he just, you know, he, he just chucked me out more or less, you know. And these men from Manchester got a job, you know, uh, and I'll never forget that. But after, it gave me a lot of confidence, and uh, and I went round nearly every church in Bolton. I had to do did a bit of summit on it. Oh, mm. not sure. I noticed amongst your many treasures that you got a couple of steam engines. No, I've got a lot of steam engines. Used, <laughs> yeah, well, the last yeah. time I saw you had two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you've yeah. got more than that. Yeah. But they were used mainly and primarily for hauling heavy loads along the highways. It yeah. had a living cabin behind. Yeah. Very mm. often a water trailer towed behind yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, can you explain your fascination with live steam? And oh, tell us yeah. some more about the building, the the, the vehicles and how you said Yeah, yeah. The, the thing is that, <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, they're on the, on the, born in a triangular railway line, so he went to sleep to the sound of bang, 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 all, all, uh, you know, all, all the bloody couplings. night light, yeah. And then, of course, the fur, you know, like going to the fur at uh, Moor Lane, uh, there, there was still the odd showman's road locomotive, you know, with the candy floss pillars and all that. There were no fancy lights and there were no shine on them, but just fascinated me with I mean when you're only a little lad about seven years old and something you, about you these great steam, big there. big wheels like seven foot in diameter you think can, can a man drive that I actually played truant to to watch it the fur I always went from Bolton to uh, to Farmworth and I used to develop a very bad stomachache you know and uh, <laughs> no, you know so I could yeah. have uh, the morning off to uh, watch yeah. the traction engine come by with with the, the bloody dodgems and caravan up back and all the rest of it. Anyway, one year I went to fur and then anyway, it was Christmas and Bolton holidays, but it had gone. Gone, you know, like not there no more. All the diesels, bum 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 bum, yeah. you know. And uh, and it, it faded from my mind a bit. When I when I went in for my scholarship to art school, I actually drew a traction engine from memory and, and my mother kept it and, and years later I looked at it and thought you know, how ridiculous my mind must have been distorted. They're not really like that, but it was from like what I remember as a little teeny bopper, you know, when I was about seven. Anyway, when I got a bit older, when I got to 15 years old and of boozing age, sneaking in pubs, you know, back way and all that, I met this Scotch lad who were a welder at an ironworks up Great Lever. And I'm trying to explain to him what a showman's engine looks like, a fairground engine. And he said, oh, he said, my boss has got one of them in backyard at works, he said, all rossing away. And it were in the days when pub shut at three o'clock, so they were off to Luca. And it were only the same one, you know, this his lordship it were called. 
and he bought it off of, of a gent called Silcox, who's still in the fairground business, in the business, yeah, yeah. Yes, I know. And, uh, and he, he had it in his yard, and it looked very forlorn and as though it had never run again. Anyway, ultimately, he, with the aid of some help from other lads, like, he, he got it going. And I've never liked being, like, you know, sort of bottom of the pile. <laughs> I thought you could buy a steamroller then for 60 quid. And even even Elbert's the owner of his lordship, said that certain council had one for sale, 60 quid, that's all they wanted. No takers, so gas axe, they cut it up. Uh, and I, right, I went I had all, all the way to Wales for mine, uh, off two Welsh scrap iron merchants. So I've got my steamroller, and, you know, we're in a terrible state like they all are after, you know, 1910s a long time yeah, ago. And, and all the word and all that, and I started up front and worked my way in, well, it's still not quite done even now, but it, it's took nearly 40 bloody years ah, of hard labour. Looked, looks beautiful. Yeah, though. and then that, when I nearly finished that, i become quite famous with the television thing, you know, and I did a beer advert for Green Hall's Bitter, and they paid me a lot of money, and I thought, with this, I'm going to buy a traction engine, you know. So I bought a traction engine, which I've been working on for... 27 years and two divorces. It's nearly finished. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can understand about the divorces when you look at it that way. <laughs> what, but one thing I've been interested in, because I watched those television programs of yours about um, industrial archaeology. It's yeah. not a usual name, mm. but there's an awful lot of Victorian and even earlier buildings which are beautiful. Yeah. when you look at them in a particular way mm, mm, mm. and you see them standing forlornly in the, <laughs> on a street somewhere yeah. and you know that there's an enormous history behind them mm. how did you come about getting involved with that? Well, is when, it, when I were a joiner the... yeah, when I were a joiner the, the, the buildings I used to work on, a lot of them up Charlie New Road, the big mansions were all Victorian and, and the beauty and quality of the workmanship were quite incredible to me, you know, I mean, <coughs> round bare windows with curved glass in and all that, Just nobody bothers doing things like that now, you know, yeah, and all, and uh, I mean, it's, it's, to me, we live in an age of ugly buildings, a lot of them are terrible, you know. Yes, they are indeed. Now, like me, you're no longer a young buck. Mm. And it must often feel that you'd prefer to settle for a calmer life, sort of mm. go with the flow, as it were. Mm. Has the next generation of Dibners decided when that they want to follow in your footsteps? Well, I've got are they doing? two two little lads, Jack and Roger. Well, who, I met Jack. Yeah, actually. yeah. Well, he's fifteen now, and he's uh, he'll be here next Wednesday. He uh, he's steeped in steam. You know, he loves the steam job. He's not got a great deal of love for the modern world. Roger's a bit more, uh, you know, a bit more like a proper lab, like, you know, he's... Uh, he's is he like, academic, he, he, or is it just uh, Oh, no, no, no they're, they're a bit like me. I don't think they're over bright, but they're, I, they're, they're, they can don't tell you all... Don't put yourself down, Fred. They, they can tell you all about steam engines, and because uh, they were, like, weaned, weaned on them, really, uh, you know. But the, the steeple jacket's no good no more. I mean, it's habit, you know, there's no chimneys left, is there? That's I mean, you, there's, there's still plenty of steeple jacket work if you want to uh, travel the, 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 the length and breadth of England to oil refineries and all sorts of horrible places where, you know, like call them chemistry but, sets. Yeah, they're, not, they're, they're not brick like, chimneys. Oh, no, they they're not be beautiful. Steel guy yeah, chimneys. yeah, yeah, dying things, yeah. 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 I call them Tim Whistles, you know. <laughs> they look very much like yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Earlier on, I mentioned your yard. Actually, the garden's on a steep slope into the valley, and many mm. of the buildings appear to be getting ready to escape down to the <laughs> bottom themselves, <laughs> except for the telegraph pole piling. Yeah, yeah. That you've got set oh, into oh, the yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. soil. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful yeah. wood telegraph pole. Before <laughs> you started the project... Yeah. Did you have an idea about extending everything out, or was it just well, no, because when, there wasn't when, enough space well, on yeah, the when, flat? Yeah, when I came living here, there were only one way into this garden, and that was down a little flight of stairs over there. And the um, stone steps, and of course, the Earl of Bramford, who was the landlord, 
his agent, Stanley D. Boardman, Stanley Daglish Boardman. Daglish. Uh, oh, he, he had a big, splendid office in Silverwell Street, which is, is still there, but it's somewhere else now. Solicitors, I think, somewhere like that, yeah. insurance office. He, when I got married, he said, uh, where are you living? You know, I, I said, I'm uh, living with my mum, like looking for an house, you know, that I can do up. And he said, oh, I said, bad news, not living with your in-laws. Uh, how are Brian, like, you know, we have trouble with the mother, his daughter-in-law and all that. He said, I'll find you a cottage somewhere. Anyway, they own quite a lot of property in Bolton, uh, all, all connected with land and what have you, you know. Uh, <coughs> and anyway, he found me this one. And I paid seven and six a week rent 40 years ago. And he only gave it me because it was falling down, you see. And he knew that, you know, I'd stop it raining in and I would put a few tie bars through it, stop back falling out. And I did all of this and uh, time went by. And, of course, before I came living here, I'd already got my steamroller. And I said, well, if you... I come and have a look. And I, and I worked out by a bit of civil engineering. If I, if I took two flights of the railings out and dug a... Dug a like a... Uh, 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 a, a Swiss type <laughs> mountain road down, down the edge of the hillside I could uh, I could get the steam engine into what onto a piece of fairly large land like and so I said well we, we, we could let, let you do that so we took down the railings and I knew a bit of a bent quarry man on the way bridge and we got a, about five wagon loads of ballast <laughs> and made a road you say and of course everybody come out to watch Fred's precious steamroller descend an hundred feet into the river Tong but it never did <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't we didn't get away with it we the road came from the gate down to that big tree over there and then of course when you come round the corner of the tree it were grass it weren't like cinders like this it were all grass and and we, we came off the edge of the ballast and the bloody thing sunk in the muck up to the ash pan underneath so we had to dig it out like so we, you know when we came we got some more ballast and more rock and what have you and made the ground more stable and, and then finally the sheds and the buildings and the steam engines and the machinery started off in a very small way it were built in a way by stealth it, it because I were rather lived in fear at Earl of Bradford and what he might do if I put a shed up for keep me engine in. Uh, we tied a piece of wood in between two trees and put a sheet over it, a wagon sheet, and kept the engine under there. And then all the demolition work that I, you know, like sites I worked on, we found some wooden roof trusses that were just about right size. So we tied them to the pole that were tied to two trees <laughs> and put three bits of telegraph pole at the other side. And then we put a stolen British rail plastic sheets over it. So when it rained, they all, they all caved in and went like bathtubs full of water. You used to have a brush steel with a nail on the end and stick it through so it all yeah. run out. <laughs> and, and so that then, they come to build St. Peter's Way 30 odd years ago. And uh, my father somewhere wrong with garden fence and he purloined an eight before sheet of of marine ply concrete shuttering wood off one of the Irish lads who were doing the the bridges actually behind yeah. Burning Park and uh, when I went down seeing him you know he said where you got that from like you know he said oh said uh, he charged me a quid like you know I said can I get any more and he said I'll ask him you know anyway next thing he says oh I get you as many as you want for a quid each <laughs> so he got enough to make a proper roof over the steamroller, which is that roof there, it's the same roof, but there were no sides, you see. And then we put in curve stones and building a bit of a, a wall, curve stones on edge, and then mill window frames out of again where they were knocking well, mill I, I down. I noticed that it was and, a, yeah, a bit of a mixed bag. Yeah, yeah, and, and even the doors are mill window frames, them doors are cotton mill window frames, you know. Right. And of course, we go, nobody said out, you know, and I knew the man in the planning at Town Hall, who's long since retired, uh, and they, they did a survey and put me in my first building on the on the map, as you might say. And then, we, we, when we got the new engine, I'd, I'd already realised that, you know, like trying to mend things like traction engines with a Black & Decker is a waste of time. Yeah. You need some proper machinery. Heavy-duty machinery. And, uh, of course, we... we we were shutting mills right, left and centre and they all had their own mechanic shop 
and a lot of the tattle had never been used on wire work or anything like that. It were all in right good order, even though it were old and obsolete. Of course, it only been used make a bit of a bolt or a bit yeah. of a pin or a, something like that. Yeah. So we we ended up with with a, a shaper, a lathe, two drilling machines, a mechanical saw, all of this driven by the steam engine, uh, the steam roller. And then the problem with the steamroller was I had to come over to this end of the garden, fix some wood up, carry it back over there, carry it out the back because I didn't want everything covered with sawdust, <coughs> saw it up, pick it up again, come back in shed, throw it in the engine, <laughs> climb on the engine, throw it in the firebox <laughs> and keep steam up. You walked about 10 miles to make a brass bush four inches long, you know, so I extended the shaft out of the shed over here and put the steam engine, another steam engine that I got, a little stationary one, in a little shed. And then, of course, I got a boiler and put the boiler right where the source of fuel arrived, where oh, it still does to this one, day. It? Yeah, and, and then, of course, uh, we got, you know, like, stoke up the boiler, start the engine, turn the shaft round, uh, work the machinery. We're bloody freezing in the winter, though, at our end. Made a mistake there, really. But then we put the sides in and windows in, and it all comes to be basically like it is now. Oh, that's good, that. Now, to a casual visitor, the work you've done and the personal money that you must have expended would suggest that in this day and age, the preservation of mill engines and the equipment is deserving of government monies to ensure mm. the heritage aspect. Oh, Has cool. any such money been provided? And if not, have they ever offered an explanation? No. <laughs> It's a pity that you you hit me on a on a fairly raw subject. The the uh, local history and chamber of commerce presented me with an award and presented a cheque for two hundred and fifty quid, which I got to give to a charity of my 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 choice, as you might say. Yeah. Which I gave it to the Northern Mill Engine people who deserve a bit of help, and they don't get a lot, you know. The the thing is, I myself have had none. I, I did try uh, to open my garden to the public, not not like a theme park, just just for people who were interested, and they and they turned me down the planning department. But I, I found out I could have appealed them maybe fought on, and it it, it What's weren't. What's the particular it, reason? Was it well, well, safety or well, no, that no, nature? the fact that it's supposed to be a residential area. Even though there's murders and prostitutes and all that, it's a residential area. Perfect. The thing is that, that I was told by various councillors that if I'd have been represented better and, I, and I'd have gone about it, I, I had actually lost interest in, in, in the idea altogether because I was taken over by a lot of people who wanted to make it like a bloody theme park, you know, um, tea rooms and... and uh, you know, this for the well, children. You do that. without that. Yeah, well, I didn't do want any that. of that. I, I only wanted people here who, 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 who were interested. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that type of person. And um, But the, the powers that be deemed that I couldn't, so that were it. And, and I found out shortly afterwards that you can actually open your garden to the public for about 29 days a year without planning permission. Which that's really all I wanted. Yeah. I mean, 29 days a year, so I don't, I'm not one, after the money. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, no, people come from all over England and pull up and look through the bloody gates, yeah. Yeah. look through the railings at this unbelievable yeah. place. I mean, lots of people. Well, I think one councillor referred it to it to it as a scrap heap, you know. Like I know what they referred obviously, it to. I'm, I'm, because, I'm uh, obviously somebody who's no interest in the past or history or anything, you know. Like you, I worked, uh, or rather like your family, I worked in a bleach works many, mm. many, many years ago. Mm. And uh, the one thing that I enjoyed was going to watch them working on the Lancashire boilers oh, aye, aye, and the aye. engine house yeah. and the rope races. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that oh, was aye. really something. I'm just going to put some wood on the boiler. Right. I know your neighbours have a lot to say about transforming the site from a steep incline yeah. covered with brush to a shady but interesting area of industrial equipment. But do you feel it's right that they should take that approach well no I, I haven't got any bad neighbours he's gone <laughs> oh he's gone now <laughs> yeah. oh well that that, that, like, sa that saves like, a lot of chatter he ever had one. Uh, and he uh, 
he, it was nothing to do with being a nuisance, he was just jealous, I think. And all, we got a petition up, and we got 400 and odd names uh, on our petition, all in favour of what yeah, we did. Yeah. And we got 18 letters of support from the immediate neighbours. And the planning department gave me permission to put my pit headgear on. <laughs> and, and the man in question then set onto me the environmental agency. And they came down and looked at it all and gave me an exemption certificate. <laughs> Fred, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. I'm sure everybody will be delighted yeah, to yeah. hear what you have to say. Everything yeah. is an addition to what we already perhaps yeah, know, yeah, yeah. but the personal touch never goes amiss. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. This is probably one of the few occasions that many of you will have had the opportunity to hear Fred in his own yard talking about the things he loves more than anything else, I imagine, other than his wife and children. And so, from me, Martin Stevens, from all the crew here at Bolton Community Radio 106, thank you.